Examining Ethics with Andy Collison is hosted by the Janet Prindle Institute for Ethics at DePaul University. Today, we're going to let you listen in on a conversation between two poets about the ethics of their craft. DePaul University professor Joe Heithouse sat down with University of Michigan professor Tarfia Faizula to discuss her newest collection of poetry, Seam. All of the poems in Seam stem from interviews she conducted in Bangladesh with women who were victims of sexual assault. What good is poetry? Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, what good is poetry? What good isn't poetry? Stay with us for more from this fascinating discussion. Our producers, Christian Weishart. Hello. And Sandra Burton. Hi. Are here with me to set the stage for this interview. But before we get started, we wanted to let you all know that Tarfia Faizula's poetry and the discussion about it contain accounts of sexual assault and violence. There are also references to sex in general, so this discussion might not be appropriate for young ears. Tarfia Faizula's collection of poems, Seem, came about after she won a Fulbright grant to travel to Bangladesh to interview Barangana. And Barangana is a term that you'll be hearing a couple times over the course of this interview. And it refers to the over 200,000 women who were systematically raped during Bangladesh's war for independence from Pakistan in 1971. Tarfia interviewed many of these victims of sexual assault about their experiences during the war and after. Her poems reflect the point of view of the women she interviewed, but also examine her role as an interviewer. Here's just one of the poems that came out of those interviews. Interview with the Barangana number three. Would you consider yourself a survivor or a victim? Each week I pull hard the water from the well, bathe in my sari, wring it out, beat it against the flattest rocks. Are you Muslim or Bengali? They asked again and again. Both, I said, both. Then rocks were broken along my spine, my hair a black fist in their hands, pulled down into the river again and again, each day, each night, river, rock, fist. The river wanders this way, breaks that way. That is always the river's play. Her poetry is so powerful. It really is. And the conversation we're about to play for you all brought up so many interesting ethical questions when it comes to writing poetry. Like, what makes it okay for someone to write in another person's voice? Should poets or artists set rules for themselves when writing about sensitive subject matter? Yeah, and as much as I want to unpack all of that with you, I think we should just play the interview for our listeners. You're totally right. So here's Joe Heithouse interviewing Tarfia Faisula. I was struck by how you, a Bangladeshi American woman, could go back in time and place from before you were born and write so carefully and beautifully about such a tragedy. How does one go about writing about such a difficult subject from such a distance of time? That's such a great um, question. And I think one that one that I think about a lot, sort of whether or not we are agents of of history and agents of memory um, that we haven't necessarily experienced or lived through. But I suspect that that's what inheritance is and why inheritance is such a difficult thing to both carry and also um, ignore. Because even if I wasn't, even if I didn't live through that time, I think that as inheritors of trauma, and I think we all are, no matter where in the world we are, inheritors of some kind of trauma or another, I think we can feel it. And I think that poetry, art in general, but for me, poetry kind of allows a place to work out um, some of those feelings that we have of, of, of sort of sharing this inheritance of trauma and trying to understand how it may or may not affect us in the present moment. Present moment, and and I think also what kinds of responsibilities we have to acknowledge uh, what is difficult and what has happened um, to our predecessors in such a way that maybe we can sort of move forward into the future and avoid the same mistakes that some of those who came before us made. I wonder about the various kinds of license a poet has. Uh, I wonder if a man or someone without a connection to Bangladesh could even try to begin to tackle the subject. 
and while you share a gender and have a cultural connection to these women, what in essence allows you to write so intimately about this subject? You know, I really don't know the answer to that. So I, I guess I sort of feel like, I, I think we know when we're playing with someone else's materials and I don't know why I think that. I just think that it's sort of an instinct um, that, that we understand when something belongs to us to sort of sort through and, and when it doesn't. You know, to use to use an example, I, I sort of feel like I, I did try to write, say, a few poems from the perspective of Pakistani soldiers, because I had this feeling of, you know, well, maybe it should be a balanced perspective. Um, and I put air quotes around balanced because I think any perspective is sort of loaded one way or the other. And in, in fact, it's really difficult to come up with a balanced perspective and sometimes an attempt to create a balanced perspective can actually damage the material that you're working with. So I felt like, in a way, the male perspective was sort of ultimately damaging to to the poems I'd already written. And it felt really wrong and out of place. And in fact, I think and I hope that somebody has written um, from those perspectives, though I feel personally that I am not the person to do that. And and again, I sort of feel like, I feel like that we know when we're messing in someone else's sandbox, so to speak. And part of that, I think, is I think the best we can do is sort of be as mindful as we can with the materials that we are dealt with and as mindful as we can about how we use those materials and to what end, I think. And I had this experience recently where I was in Bloomington, Indiana, actually, at... Um, and there was a little um, there was a little shop that sold South Asian wares, and the shop owner turned out to be Pakistani. And he and I had a really interesting conversation about what the war meant to him. And I was able I had a copy of Seam with me, and so I gave it to him. And it was an interesting moment because I sort of feel like, in in some ways, I you know you you might think given the subject matter of Seam that I would be anti Pakistani, but in fact, writing Seam just kind of gave me a sense of real compassion for um, so many people who are, who are affected during wartime on either side. There are damages, I think. Well, as I interview, I'm struck by your instructions for the interviewer. The poems, what strikes me about the poems and what I love about the poems is that they don't just trudge into this subject in any way, that there's a kind of self-consciousness that is a really informing self-consciousness. So the interviewer who is some version of yourself, I suppose, is always being instructed and is always thinking throughout this whole thing. Can we get you to read some of the poems? Yeah, for sure. It's so interesting that you bring up that the interviewer is some version of me. And that's, that's true. I, I had a, I really felt like I had to create a role for the interviewer. Like I had to give her a specific job, I couldn't just approach it as myself. Um, so I created that the character of the interviewer in some way so that she could have these responsibilities that she was sort of sorting through over the course of the book. Um, okay, so this is instructions for the interviewer. Once she will say, I didn't know there was a hollow inside me until he pushed himself into it. Once you learned that inside you was not hollow, but seam, color of the rim of the river, tonguing the long dark shore of stone, reflection of yourself, an endless ripple in corrugated metal, width of the silver bangle, circling now her thin dark arm. Take the tea she offers. Once she will say, I was young like you, once you wanted anyone to fill you with blue noise, once you didn't know your own body's worth. Put the porcelain cup down. Let it slide into the saucer's waiting hollow. My theory on the book is that, or on that interviewer, is that she is a saucer. Uh -huh. That she's, she's this not as deep place 
holding a really deep vessel, a vessel filled with pain, with memory, and that the interviewer in some ways has this job of having to kind of hold a difficult vessel. It turns out that the form of the poem, right, couplet, 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 and then there it is, the saucer's waiting hollow, that the interviewer herself is the saucer's waiting hollow, the person who's willing to take in all of this stuff yeah. and hold it carefully. That's such a that's such a beautiful reading of um, of both the interviewer and of the the cup and the saucer. You know, I mean, one of the things that's so interesting about seem to me as somebody who wrote it is that oftentimes um, what it's doing is invisible to me. I did I did feel that way. I sort of felt drawn to Bangladesh. I started writing these poems um, in graduate school actually, and I hit what I what I've described. Um, elsewhere as an ethical wall. I really felt like I needed to be in Bangladesh to be in the landscape of that place. Um, and I also felt very strange about writing poems from the perspective of women who were still alive. So I feel like in some ways I went to Bangladesh to not necessarily just transcribe their stories, but to ask their permission in a way and to just make contact with them and, and share some sort of physical space. And in the course of that, I realized so many things about myself. Um, I really thought I was going, going to be writing a really dark book, ultimately, one that sort of ends in darkness because I was also going through um, a difficult time in my own personal life when I was working on these poems, um, both in Bangladesh and afterwards. And I did feel sort of this the weight, I guess, of so much and, and I guess a kind of desire to try to see how much I could actually carry and how much I was willing to let come in. I felt sort of to use the, the saucer and the cup metaphor, um, a little further, I really felt broken open in some ways by my time in Bangladesh and by my time with these women. And I really felt like one of the things I learned is that if you break something open, it allows something else to come in. And so I felt like as a really shy private person going to Bangladesh and sort of encountering these women and being willing to be questioned by them and question them, there was some sort of like both a breaking open as well as sort of a settling feeling, like that feeling of a cup into a saucer the way it feels like. Um, they really fit together somehow. I also felt that feeling as well of um, understanding something about my relationship to history and therefore to um, these women as well. There are three poems where the narrator or the, or the interviewer uh, has to acknowledge her various emotions, mm -hmm. uh, desire, shame, and grief. Can you talk about why, you know, kind of how those poems came to be and how we go from the instructions to the interviewer to the interviewer really having to look inside at her own emotion. Well, I started out um, with just the poems written from the perspective of the Birangana, the war heroines I spoke with. The longer I was in Bangladesh and the more conversations I had with them, the more I realized that maybe there was there was some value to having the interviewer's perspective in some ways. And I also sort of felt like I wanted to, I guess, sort of create a range of perspective. Um, and so there are the interview, there are the interview questions, which are the poems written from their perspective. And then there are interviewers' notes, which are in second person. And then there's the interviewer acknowledges, which are um, a different perspective entirely, almost sort of like a um, sort of further zooming out, I guess, so that the, the interviewer in some ways has to look at herself. And so I, those three feelings were ones that I felt were kind of both um, tangential to the experiences I was having with these women, but very much sort of connected to them at the same time. And there were all the uh, desire, shame, and grief were all things that I sort of felt like were experiences or sort of emotional experiences I was having that were in some way kind of triggered by or enlivened by conversation with these women. So it also felt to me like I was trying to find stories um, or resonances between us so that I felt like we were really were engaged in some kind of dialogue rather than a one-sided conversation. 
the interviewer acknowledges shame. After she has ducked through the low-slung metal shack, the war-raped women she's come to visit offer tea drowsy with sweet. They begin to speak, unlocking the desiccated coffins of their grief. The video camera's lens blinks on their dawn-thin faces until daylight spools itself back into darkness. Anything, she says, you would like to tell me, anything you can remember. She ducks back under the clothesline heavy with faded saris out to the main road. After, the rickshawwala pedals across town to a small, heat-spattered hotel room. She wraps a dark silk scarf around herself until twilight and rubs her eyes riverbank raw until she lies on the hard, narrow bed and begins to touch herself. After the familiar arched shuddering, she wishes she could cry because that at least might be redemption for each broken body that can't be restored. She doesn't feel shame's dark circle tightening after waking to the mirror, dust-webbed, nor when she boards the bus back to the city. Sunlight fades the open windows into white dreams. A child bends down to elevate a pink blossom away from a green field. It's later, when she arrives back at a borrowed flat, begins to strip off travel pungent clothes and smells her own body's resinous musk. It's when she sits down naked at the desk to rewind and fast forward through all the pixelated footage of the women's kerosene lives. It's when she begins to write about it in third person, as though it was that simple to unnail myself from my own body. Let me ask a more general question. What good is poetry? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, what good is poetry? What good isn't poetry? Um, I, I mean, I, I sort of think poetry is instinctively one, our, one of our most innate forms. You know, I think it began as an oral tradition. It's available still to the illiterate. I'm really struck by the landes, which is a form that... Um, the Pashtun women, which is the Afghani tribe, have kind of created and, and populated in some ways. The Lande is a um, couplet, and it's oftentimes playful or um, has playful or sort of ribald content. These women, you know, share these couplets between them as a way of communicating or acknowledging things that um, perhaps, you know, one wouldn't expect um, women who live in a particularly conservative way would feel. I mean, I think that just the acknowledgement of someone's interior life is so hugely important and so valuable. And so I think poetry can do that. Poetry can allow us a place and a form to understand better the conversation that we're sort of all naturally having between our interior lives and then the external world. So, you know, I think like the question is maybe not so much does poetry matter, but, you know, like, in in what ways does it not matter? I can't find very many, actually. Um, I think it's part of our day-to-day -day lives. I think it's one of the first things we're taught when we're, when we're young, like, whether it's in the form of nursery rhymes or, um, you know, in, in hymns or, you know, like, I think, like, poetic tradition pervades um, many art forms at once to this day. So I think it's... I think it's incredibly important. Is there an ethic to poetry? Are there places in poetry where maybe people dare not go, or if they go there, they should take into consideration certain things? Hmm. Well, I think that there's always a risk involved. I think that we are, you know, like, I, I mean, I feel like Seam is incredibly problematic as a book. I mean, it doesn't do anything directly for um, the women who underwent such horrors. It doesn't take it away. It doesn't erase that history. Um, you know, in some cases, it may not even get um, any number of um, these women's experiences right. But I sort of felt like, I, I felt like I, I felt sort of helpless before this material, and that helplessness made me want to take a risk to try to write it. I would say that to me, the ethics of poetry comes down to how mindfully you're practicing discernment. And I think that 
poetry is a form that makes you think about discernment. Is it this phrase or that one? Is it this image or another? Is it this word or another? And it makes one think, I think, about the history of language as well. I mean, I'm thinking about how every single word in the English language has some sort of etymology or history. And so when we are using those words, we are conjuring in some form or fashion or repopulating those histories, um, the history of those words, the history of that language. And so I guess I would say there's an ethics and discernment. Um, and I think that's why the word ethics can even come up in relation to an art form because I think an art form, whether it's poetry or sculpture or painting, is in some way a simulation we are creating of what we suppose our lives to actually be like. In this day and age where I think that we are working to build a multicultural um, democracy in America, but I also think that the entire world is engaged in this moment of globalization. I think the questions of discernment are becoming rapidly very, um, very important as we try to understand how we can be different from each other, but simultaneously share a space and, and what that means. So I feel like in the same way, poetry asks me to think about those questions, what things share, you know, can and should share a space. Um, what things that don't seem like they can share a space actually do quite beautifully share a space. Um, in some ways, like beauty and suffering, for example, to me, they seem to occupy two sort of seemingly disparate realms, but they often occupy the same space. You know, just because a country is war torn doesn't mean it's not beautiful, for example. Or, you know, like I even sort of think of how, um, you know, watching, say, kind of like the community gather around somebody who's lost a loved one. You know, you can sort of see that there's an ebb and flow to the way that we um, sort of like separate and come together at the same time. And so I guess I sort of think that um, ideally speaking, poetry allows you to behave more ethically because you're thinking more mindfully about how to discern between choices. But again, I feel like that for me has come with come after sort of years of trying to understand and getting really wrong, I think, what poetry can and can't do in some ways. But for me, um, something that I tell my students is that there is a beautiful courage, I think, in, in failing because you've at least risked trying um, something that is unutterable, unutterable in the first place anyway. Stealing your question from Seam, why call any of it back? Oh, God. <laughs> Why well, call any of it back? You know, it's something that I ask myself a lot because I try really hard to be very much in the present moment. But I feel, you know, sort of like there are times when there's nowhere but the past to look for answers to some of these questions I think we have of um, what does it mean to be a human? What does it mean to to try to, um, what does it mean to hurt others? What does it mean to be hurt by others? And so I guess I feel like the reason to call any of it back is to to try to see if instead of just sort of like, you know, dumping out the past um, as though it's as though it's garbage and sort of let it stay in these kind of like huge messy heaps, I I wonder if there's some power or some deeper sort of sense of compassion or understanding we can have for um, not just the past, but also for um, the future. And I think, you know, poetry and looking at the past through poetry kind of allows us to illuminate some of those dark corners that we might be ashamed to look at. And I think something about bringing, bringing some of that into the light can allow us to move on from it and not carry it um, carry it as though there were sort of chains. Like I think one of the things that writing seem helped me understand is that you can simultaneously remember and let go at the same time. And both, both actions are important, I think, in terms of considering what we can do in the present moment to be more compassionate to ourselves and to others. Um, and also sort of like maybe reminding us that that's a thing we can do in the future as well as in terms of how just life tools. Did you set any rules for yourself going into the interviews? And if so, did they change? And then sort of, did you set any rules for your own writing? I'm kind of always giving myself stern talking tos. And um, I gave myself the stern talking to right before I went to Bangladesh. I told myself that 
I may not write a single poem from this experience, but that I had to go and be open to what it was going to show me. And when I applied for the Fulbright, one of the things that I said in my proposal is that I wanted to write a book of poems about this experience. But realistically, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do that. And I didn't want to impose any, um, I didn't want, I didn't want to force a book into being. And so when I went to Bangladesh, it, you know, it was a hard thing at first just to live there. And then um, a hard thing too, to try to find people who would know where to get in touch with some of these women who had undergone that. I mean, it's not like I could take a Craigslist ad out, you know, and sort of be like, hey, women who have undergone this horrible trauma, would you be willing to speak to me? So a lot of it was me sort of carefully just asking questions to what I was trying to feel out as being the right people who might have be able to point me in some sort of direction. And eventually I met a scholar who um, whose friend was a freedom fighter, um, a female fighter during the war. Her name is Safina Lohani. And she, after the war was over, had created basically a safe space for a number of these women. And so um, I spoke, I spent time with um, her and some of the women in that community. And so one of the rules that um, I imposed upon myself was that I was going to be open to what the conversations were going to be like and not necessarily impose anything, you know, anything super strong onto the conversations. And so I would just go and I would meet with these women and try to get to know them. And I would have my questions, um, but I didn't ask them, say, sort of like in a way that felt really back and sort of like one sided, I guess. Um, it wasn't like I immediately showed up, had the questions, went right to right, right, right into asking the questions. We actually hung out quite a bit, and they were curious about me, and they asked me a number of questions as well. And so, one of the filters that was just kind of immediately created was that, you know, the the questions in some ways had to have a corresponding answer that. Um, did not necessarily directly answer the question because that felt truer to how the conversations actually were. And plus, like, I think that when we're asking people to um, go back into their past and go back into memory, the answers don't come out linearly in the first place. So I tried to sort of acknowledge that the way that history is and memory is often told slant by sort of slanting the their perspectives a little bit away from the questions. And then, so another filter I created was point of view. I had to, I guess, sort of like, it, it was important to me to adopt multiple points of view in the longer sequence. And so needing, sort of creating those three different points of view kind of really helped me winnow down what needed to be said versus, you know, what sort of poem just felt like it was good or, you know, potentially past muster. I've worried, you know, when, when the book first got picked up, it didn't actually make me happy. Like I, I felt sort of worried because I wondered what it meant that these stories would be out and that they would be out in poem form and whether or not, um, you know, sort of taking what they had told me or what I myself had imagined because a number of the poems aren't even based on my conversations with them. They're from the imagination as well. And so whether or not that impulse to imagine and then translate through poetry, through the lyric moment, um, something horrific and difficult that actually happened to people, I wondered whether or not it was okay. And I also sort of worried that that it was essentially exploitative in some ways because obviously I'm the one here having this conversation with y'all. It's not the women who this actually happened to. And so I, you know, I still feel conflicted about um, this work. And I know that, you know, that in classrooms, I think that that subject, that question has come up, you know, is this an exploitative work? Do these poems um, seek to inform rather than exploit? And my you know, my, my intention was for these poems to inform and explore rather than exploit. But again, I sort of also think that when, when we create anything and we put it out into the world, we do it with a certain amount of vulnerability, not knowing how it's going to be received or whether or not we've done right by whatever it is that we've tried to do. So I do feel sort of 
a number of ethical concerns about the work still to this day. And, you know, like I think the the best I can say is that I think what, what I can say about it with some amount of certainty is that I tried. But I think that, you know, oftentimes we're not necessarily uh, given credit for trying. We're sort of given credit for how close to, you know, uh, I guess perfect we can get a thing. And, you know, I tried to write a book that instead sort of seeks to acknowledge its own messiness in some ways. And that was my way of acknowledging that I feel that it's, you know, ethically really complicated material. Ethics is such a difficult word. Truth, maybe just as or more. Do you feel like the bo- the poem in some ways got at the truth of their experience? I mean, I mean, I think so, but I don't know for sure. One of the things that was really interesting about the life of Seam after it became published was that a number of you know, to me, what I, one of the things I was worried about, well, how are other Bangladeshi is going to receive this work? And it's been, some of the poems have been translated. Some of the poems have been used in a play that's about, um, by a group called the Komala Collective. Um, they did a show in London using some of the poems that's, and the, the show itself is, is about, is called Birongana Woman of War. And so I think that, you know, a number of people who I, sort of, I suppose, think of as having some sort of authority on the subject seem to think that I've captured those experiences and those feelings. And the poems have been translated into Bengali as well. But again, you know, I I think sort of that some folks, I've also, you know, have had some folks tell me that I got it totally wrong. I had, um, you know, a family member tell me that um, all the women I spoke to were lying. So I also feel like there are at any given point any number of perspectives that one could have about this material and whether or not I got it or, you know, quote unquote, got it right or not. It's worth the attempt, even if it's a failed one. But that, um, but that ultimately, you know, I think the work seeks to get at the truth, but I think it's up to the reader to discern whether or not it's done that work or not. And either answer makes sense to me, whether or not you think that, it, you know, if you think it's untruthful, that makes sense to me because I think there's a way to read it in such a way that it does not seem truthful. And then I think there's a way to read it in a way that, um, that sort of acknowledges the truth of it. The truth is hard. Like, I don't, you know, I don't even know what the truth is half the time. Thank you so much for joining us, Torfia. Thank you so much, Joe. It's been a real pleasure to be here. Okay, that was incredible. Um, and I, I love this whole interview, but I think the part that I think the part that will stick with me the most is Tarfia's idea of like an ethics in discernment. That if you're an artist or a writer, the the choices you make actually matter. Yeah, that was really cool. I think my favorite part is how she balances these conflicting perspectives of the truth. And she doesn't really seem to be concerned about that there are people out there who think that the Barangana are lying because she knows that she has captured at least their perspective truthfully. And I think that's a really beautiful way to think about truth. Totally. Joe and Tarfia zeroed in on what I think is one of the more important ethical questions that artists face, uh, taking other people's experiences and turning them into art. And what I found striking is the level of thought put into it. Uh, I think a lot of people easily default to thinking that you just need the person's permission and you're good. And Tarfia didn't do that. She focused on a lot of other morally relevant features. She talked about whether or not the art would be of benefit to the people whose experiences she was describing. She also talked about what her intentions as an artist were. And those are two very morally important features, and I think it's very easy to overlook those. Thanks for listening. If you'd like more information about the topics we've discussed today, visit our show notes for this episode at examiningethics.org. When you visit, be sure to sign up for our newsletter. You'll be entered into our monthly book giveaway. For updates about the podcast, interesting links, and more, follow us on Twitter, at Examining Ethics. If you like what you've heard, please consider rating us on iTunes. 
you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast app. And hey, it would be really great if you told a friend about our show. Hi, this is Jessica Keister, one of the interns for Examining Ethics, and I'll be reading the credits for this episode here outside the Prindle Institute. Examining Ethics with Andy Cullison is hosted by the Janet Prindle Institute for Ethics at DePaul University. Sandra Burton and Christian Weishart produced the show. Our interns are myself and Leah Williams. Our music is by Corey Gray and Kai Engel and can be found online at freemusicarchive.org. Examining Ethics is made possible by the generous support of DePaul alumni, friends of the Prindle Institute, and you, the listeners. Thank you for your support.